here. Okay, so welcome to a, another um, painting tutorial. It is around noon on Tuesday, so a little delayed start with painting today. Um, I finally came up with the idea of bringing a um, little rhodia pad. So I got this little rhodia pad for um, writing down on it throughout our painting um, any ideas for future paintings. And I also grabbed a book off my shelf. Um, this is a Ron Ranson written book, uh, Learn Watercolor the Egger Whitney Way. I'm not sure if this one had a, um, a sleeve on top of it. It's a really interesting book. It is interviews and po compiled by Ron Ranson. It's interviews of um, students of Edgar Whitney and talking about his techniques and his philosophy of um, painting and composition. And then goes on to um, interview the artists themselves that have careers stemming from uh, learning from Edgar Whitney. It was a really good book. And it has a section, and I'm not going to flip through the book because I think that'd be a whole, like, copyright law type thing. But um, there's two interesting sections that pop into mind, um, element of design and uh, the principle of design. And from this, it kind of breaks it down into what he considered was important. And I think what we'll do is kind of look at one of those things throughout different videos and... Um, you know, use that as inspiration for something to talk about as a kind of keynote for that video. And when I was looking at it, um, just trying to get an idea, one of the ones was value and um, having the concept of having a, um, a uniform value to get the feel for it, like a dominant, sorry, a dominant value taking place. So I was thinking, um, uh, a dark value to dominate it and having a, a a light object on top of a dark object so we're gonna go with landscapes with the trees of course and playing around so I think we're gonna have that and we're gonna pull out highlights on the trees and whatnot so that's the direction I think we're gonna take um, if that happens or not I'm not sure but that is the goal for it um, I also have a lot of books by Ron Ranson himself, so we can do paintings eventually inspired by Ron Ranson within the book and kind of talk about it and see what my approach would be or his approach. We can look at James Fletcher Watson books. I have a book that, um, Miss Margaret had sent me in the mail, um, and I'm just not sure the name right off the bat of the artist. But he had a very interesting approach. Uh, I think his trees were very beautiful. I just, uh, um, it might be Bromwell, might have been his name. I'm just, I don't have the book in front of me. And I also have a lot of Zoltan Sabo's books, and he has a lot of different experiments and concentrations, um, you know, things to explore. So we could probably spend a lifetime just doing videos with um, prompts inspired by Zoltan Sabo. Um, on one of the Facebook pages I had posted a video where it was uh, one of the triads that we had done and it had a very Zoltan Sabo vibe to it and I had mentioned that you know halfway through it I started feeling that effect and somebody commented that they had the pleasure of actually taking classes with them so that must have been an awesome experience. I also have, you know, so I have, I have different miscellaneous um, watercolor books and art books. And, and like I said, I think that'd be good um, prompts. And then our own prompts and things that we want to experiment with, like triads and whatnot. We'll do that as well. And then eventually, I'm going to have to figure out how to do playlists on um, YouTube. 
but I'm still in that kind of just um, just doing tutorials, just having fun, just painting every day, especially with um, you know work being out for over a month. Um, you know, due to what's going on with the um, the the health crisis right now, and yeah. Oh, I do have a very interesting um, book. I think it's called My Way with Watercolor. Um, the artist, I think its name starts with a C. Unfortunately, I think he's deceased. But he had a very, um, very interesting uh, painting style. And his book focused a lot on textural techniques and using uh, razor blades and stuff like that for achieving those. So that was... That's uh, somebody that we'll pull from as well. And then I have, um, you'll find that like when you do art, you wind up having just so many books. My favorite art movement is the Hudson River Valley and the Tonalist movements, the movements of the 1800s. So I have um, books on that. George Inez, um, with Thomas Cole, not so much um, painting tutorial books, but more you know discussing their lives and talking about um, their you know the paintings themselves and like just the you know, quotes by them and the quotes of the critics and whatnot. I have um, some books on Whistler, but I think a lot of those books were more focused on the portraits and whatnot, which, I don't know, I never really, we did portrait painting and life painting in college and drawing, you know, that's that's where you, you learn from, but I don't know if it's something that I really want to uh, get back into. I really do enjoy landscape painting. It's it's a good release. It's a good. You know, I feel you know it's a good genre of art. People ask me about um, animal paintings. If I do paintings of animals and whatnot, and I don't do that either. But I think watercolor lends itself very well to that. You'll see people that do paintings of dogs and cats and you know um, and birds. And the wet and wet and the fusion looks beautiful. So that might be something I explore down the line. It's um, pretty prominent in the Chinese painting, especially with birds. But I would probably have to switch up my brush to a different type of brush to get that. Anyway, okay, so um, with this one, we wanted to kind of really do a darkened um, overall uh, dominant tone. So I'm gonna feed in a sky like normal with that raw sienna and a lizard. Then I have a feeling we're gonna just mix some darks and really kind of make everything else dark and then start pulling and playing around with that. So we'll make it as if it's backlit, a sunset or a sunrise. We'll darken everything else. Let's see. So let's grab ultramarine. And if you mix ultramarine with uh, burnt umber, which I didn't put any fresh burnt umber down. It's been kind of a while for that. You'll get a gray. And... Wow, it has been a while since I've opened this one. If you're ever having trouble opening a tube, you want to squeeze the paint up to the end. Because when you twist, this part will try to twist and that paint being there will help prevent that. I also have a shell cracker. That get it to move. Yeah, 
And you could also run um, water over tubes and that'll help out as well, like warm water. You have to be care careful with the shell cracker because that can you know, break the, uh, the cap. That's a good useful tool. So I'm mixing that burnt umber into the ultramarine. I'm gonna start feeding that in. This is a good mixture for a cloudy day, but like I said, I really just want a darker tone. So I'm gonna really start increasing this concentration here. And we might have to use Payne's Gray for the, um, the black that's in the Payne's Gray itself. Maybe we'll wind up lifting out a moon or something as well. So we're going to try to keep this band in some way, shape, or form as a bat lit, back lit effect. Uh, but let's get dark. Here's some Payne's Gray mixing in now. Just adding shapes, what they are, I really don't know. Are they bushes, are they clumps, are they gonna be rocks? I'm not sure, but put that there. We're gonna have the silhouette of that horizon and trees, so we can put those in dark. That'll show how strong of a pigment we're putting in. As always, feel free to um, copy along. Um, I'd love to see your results. You know, see how you all doing. See what you think. Of course, in the comments section, you know, feel free to leave comments, um, questions, or advice. You know, if you um, if I start talking to us about something, and I I don't fully delve into it, and you have knowledge about it, go for it. You know, share that advice in the comments. Um, if I make a mistake with a historical thing or a fact or anything like that, please um, let me know in the comments. Um, yeah, I'd love to hear from you all. Um, what else? When I do this, I'm flattening the paper out. Get another layer of dark paint up on top, and then we'll start putting in our um, a tree that we were talking about, and then we'll try to lift out some highlights on that tree trunk. So this is essentially, I think, just going to be kind of a, a tonalist painting, like almost a very pure tonalism. I don't think we're going to lift out a moon because we have this sunset, so that probably wasn't making sense, that comment that I had made earlier. Keep that there. 
you could lift a little bit. Some of these to give some texture and variety. Put some more of our darks down in here. Also down below, I have a whole bunch of different links. Um, I have uh, a link for a Patreon if you'd like to become a supporter. And essentially that money will go towards buying you know, more paper and supplies and whatnot. Um, I have my Etsy account linked down below. If you ever want any of these paintings, I put them up for um, sale up on the Etsy. Uh, what else? I think I have links for the Facebook page and Instagram and whatnot. So, you know, social media, check it all out. Maybe we could leave this as a little bit of water too. And then in a moment, we're going to do our big, bold statement of the trees. And we're going to want a dark. I'm going to push it more towards the brown. I just want the big pigment with it. We're still wet and wet everywhere. I don't think we're going to bother with a dry off yet. This does seem to help with, you know, diffusion and whatnot and having fun. Just kind of looking at the sky, see if we want to keep it the way it is. And I think, um, I think it'll be pretty good. We'll keep it like that. Okay. So, time to go at it, aren't Let's grab our rigger. Rigger is the number one silver black velvet. It's probably about a seven to ten dollar brush. Amazon, Blick.com. Um, I don't really use other art sources. I think I use Cheap Joe's art stuff. Yeah, to get my uh, my Hake brushes, um, and I. Think think maybe in England they might have a different supplier of those things it might be um is it Jackson art supplies in England or Ben something I'm not sure so right now we have a dark object over the light very um, tonalist type composition. I'll probably, like I said, pull out some highlights on the trees and that'll be the front lit. Overall, this is on the darker edge of things. So that was kind of the main experiment today was just um, seeing what's going to happen with a, uh, I guess it'd be a low key is what they would call it. Like a high key tonality or low key tonality. Let's see what happens to this effect when we do a little bit of lifting. Um, when I pull it out taut like this, it's to get kind of the narrower bands. And 
going to be feeding a lot of pigment in here since it's wet and wet. And it's going to soften dramatically as we dry. One thing I'm beginning to wonder, and I kind of don't want to ask this question because I don't want to do it. Um, the drying itself, I think the mailman just delivered something. Um, the blow drying itself, I wonder if that's causing a dispersion of particles. And I wonder how this would dry naturally. But with the last fast and loose painting, unless I paint it all the way to this point and then just let it dry and then I'm done, I can see. But I genuinely am just not somebody who would walk away from painting for an hour and let it dry. I'm, I guess they call it alla prima, I believe is the Italian term. French term, um, non-English term for uh, getting things done in one go and pass. We could have different objects growing. Creating, and that's going to, mainly for the sake of, um, a rhythm, a pattern. At this point is when I just kind of go back and forth between Payne's Gray Ultramarine and my either Burnt Umber or um, Burnt Sienna just to get a dark just to happen. I think we did discover that we could um, mix the Venetian red with some of those darks to get an interesting dark as well. And I'm not sure if it was because of the um, opacity of the Venetian red. But that was quite interesting seeing that. If you have phthalo blue with your um, burnt umber, that gives you a very good, interesting um, dark. Endothron blue, I believe, mixes um, the interesting darks as well. We could even come in with a big, larger tree right here over all this. I have a brush hair on there. Somebody um, in one of the art groups had went to a museum and, you know, took pictures of, you know, famous paintings. It was an oil painting. And, like, right there in this, like, historical oil painting was one of the brush hairs that the original artist had used. And they had they'd shared that. Um, I thought that was quite funny that they were dealing with the same issues we have. With the um, watercolor, the hake is, I believe, goat hair. And... Um, for some reason, I think that the natural 
uh, haired brushes maybe more, more prone to shedding but then it could also be simply something like uh, just the quality of the brush itself but something like this where I'm pretty sure this is synthetic I don't think it says what it is I mean, I'm re not really sure on, I'm not up on the up and up on brushes but that might be a um, thing with those I'm enjoying this one We didn't do too much lifting in these trees, so let's see what happens. I'm trying to get this nice and narrow for it. Might be something that we could come in and re-wet. Ooh, that's an idea. Let's write that down. Let's do, for a potential video, sharpening a magic eraser. to a point. Okay, there we go. That is a potential thing we can explore in future videos whenever I get around to it. We can sharpen a magic eraser and see if we can use it as a, a pencil eraser. What I'm thinking is I might have to actually just darken these trees as opposed to trying to lighten them up, darken the backside of it to let that happen. Now, for the moment that I've been dreading the dry off and seeing how everything shifts. So take a good look at it now and see how everything changes as we dry it. Okay, that was a massive shift that took place. Um, I don't know how well it showed up on the camera, but um, we, had, we had quite the softening of everything. So there's two things I could take away from this, is not put any foreground element until um, after that drying. So let's write that down as a, um, as a potential or no major foreground element to drawing. No foreground element.
till after dry off. This is something I've done in other videos where I do the whole background dry and let that soften. But what we can do next time is explore that dry off, seeing if we want to accessorize and bring out some uh, variation in that mid ground, and then really go to town with that foreground. So with this one, the only thing I would want to do is really harp on this guy. I feel like if I do go back in and try to play around amongst that, it would just um, not work out. And I know I'm always talking about experimenting and exploring, but um, I just, um, visualizing it and seeing it, I'm just not, I'm not down with that for this one. And we'll see how it is. With the drying shift, um, that's a term that I picked up from handprint.com. There is this rabbit hole on the internet called handprint.com where this gentleman or I think, I think it's a, a guy, a, a man who made the page. He no longer updates it and he has just just ex crazy extensive tests and studies and compilations and numbers about how different uh, paintings uh, paints are different brands, um, light fastness, um, palettes of different painters, um, what degree everything shifts by. It's um, it's just it's just insane the amount of knowledge and um, scientific tests that this guy had done. I think he even talks about. Uh, proper mixture water amounts and ratios and at what point it starts to affect things and whatnot it, it's just it's so overwhelming um, and I think I stumbled across that whenever I was trying to find an initial palette to set up so I find that the Ron Ransom palette is a fantastic palette. It is lemon yellow, raw sienna, burnt sienna, burnt umber, Phoenician red, uh, sorry, light red, alizarin crimson, ultramarine, and Payne's gray. That is, I believe, the common palette. Then added onto that in books, he added on, um, Cerulean, and maybe one or two other ones. My palette, I went with that as a basis. I have Cerulean available for experiments. I find that once in a while it really kind of brings a, it makes it interesting painting. I also have the Thalo Blue. Not sure if we use thalo blue in this one. I, th I know I had mentioned you could use it for really interesting darks. So thalo blue, um, I add the sap green, and that's a convenience color. Plus, it's um, kind of triad that I like to use, or no, sorry, part of that duo with the Venetian red. I have buff titan on my palette which that's something we're going to need to do a video of. So I don't mean just doing so many stops and writing stuff down, but this is kind of that stuff. Um, just putting ideas together. So buff Titan as a um, video. I do have a lot of other pigments because that's what happens. And those are ones that I stick with. And if you have those on hand, you could pretty much paint anything landscape wise. Palettes for still lives or um, 
people, portraits, I, I'm really not sure what people use for those. <laughs> I don't think we did any scraping really in this one. All right, let's try this and see what happens. Sure what's going on right here but add a little Okay, now it's just time for the mat, and we signed it already. And then we'll photograph it, and I'll get this video up for y'all. Alright, hope you enjoyed. Uh, have a great day, and I'll see y'all soon.